Howdy Doodle, Scott Guthrie, Kevin Scott, Scott Hanselman. It's time for The Great Scott Show. Seth, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's because we got a bunch of Scots. I thought I would try to... That is true. But no, it's called Into Focus. Yeah, we have all the Scots, but we have so much more. Like demos, a round table, and questions from our great audience. That sounds a little bit more correct, and it's in front of a live virtual audience. It's Into Focus at... Microsoft Build. I'm Seth Juarez, Principal Cloud Advocate for All Things AI. And I'm Felicia Shah, Program Manager for Visual Studio LiveShare. And this is Into Focus, the show within a show at Microsoft Build. It's like showception. And we're definitely not on the same set. I was just on wearing the same clothes I've been in all day. It's not, it's just different. No, it's not. It's, it's, we're going to ignore that, you know. But for the next two hours, we'll be taking over your screens along with our very special co-host, the one and only partner program manager and the world's OKS programmer, Scott Hanselman. Woo! Hey, fantastic. Uh, lower your expectations, everybody. I appreciate that. When did I get the award of world's OKS programmer? I gave it to myself, forgot about that. You tend to do that, but you know it's okay. The honor is all yours, and it's great to have you, Scott. It's great to be here, and in fact, I'm so excited to be with all of you, our audience members. We've got 40 members of our Microsoft community from around the world. Wow. South Africa, Nigeria, Thailand, just name a few, all joining us via Teams. Hey, everybody. Woo! Woo! I feel like I'm at an NBA game because I'm such a sports specimen. I think, a sports mm -hmm. ball You are a guy. specimen. So here's what's coming up. Microsoft EVP, Scott Guthrie gets unplugged at home. Then Scott Hanselman, you're up. I am, in fact. And meeting up with my team in Redmond was quite the hero's journey. Luckily, there was a film crew there to document it all. I'll also be doing a live demo with Julie Strauss. It'll expand on what she showed during Amanda Silver's day one executive talk. Plus, we'll hear from other superstars like VP Julia Lucent, Rajesh Jha, Kevin Scott, and GitHub's Brian Douglas. This is amazing. Then we'll cap things off with a roundtable on the future of open source. Well, now it's time for Scott Guthrie Unplugged and at Home. This is Into Focus at Microsoft Build. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Build 2021. Build is all about developers, and we're incredibly excited to talk to you this week about some of the work that we're doing that enables developers to build even better apps and solutions uh, and deliver even more impact to the world. This past year has been a year really unlike any other, and developers have been absolutely critical to helping businesses, governments, and people everywhere respond and adapt to the challenges of the pandemic. And as we work to reimagine our future, you know, developers have never been more important to the world. Microsoft was founded 46 years ago as a developer tools company. You know, at the time, our first and only product uh, was Microsoft Basic. And developers and the platforms and tools they use have been core to Microsoft's DNA ever since. And today, we have the richest developer tools in the world with Visual Studio, GitHub, and .NET. And with the Microsoft Cloud, we have an incredibly rich platform that developers can use to build apps and solutions that can reach any person on the planet. And we want to empower all of you to build what comes next. Now, no other company has the breadth and depth of the solutions that we deliver at Microsoft. And the Microsoft Cloud, obviously, is critical to enabling that. What makes the Microsoft Cloud uh, particularly rich is just the set of uh, rich set of services it delivers. You know, with Microsoft Azure, you know, we provide the underlying cloud infrastructure and cloud platform that you need. And then on top of it, we have rich SaaS-based capabilities with Microsoft 365 and with Dynamics 365 that allow you to connect to employees and reinvent business processes uh, all in a SaaS-based way. And with our Power Platform, we provide the glue that allows you to stitch all of these solutions together to accelerate digital transformation. 
With GitHub and Visual Studio, we have the world's richest developer tools and services. And you know, with our built-in security capabilities, uh, you can go ahead and protect all these solutions and uh, manage them with a common identity control plane uh, that enables you to kind of securely run any workload uh, anywhere. No other cloud vendor offers this fully comprehensive developer experience and overall platform capabilities. Over 95% of the largest 500 companies in the world today are now building amazing applications using this Microsoft Cloud. And throughout Build This Week, many of our customers across every industry are gonna share about how they're using the Microsoft Cloud to help themselves digitally transform and reimagine how they engage with their employees and customers. You know, a great example of uh, an amazing organization that's, that's driving a really transformational cloud strategy uh, and becoming uh, an even deeper digital technology company is UBS, uh, which is one of the largest financial institutions in the world. You know, three years ago, UBS announced a plan uh, to make the firm more agile uh, by leveraging the cloud, uh, to build new client experiences uh, and be able to support their clients using leading edge digital solutions. Uh, and today now more than 50% of their computing power uh, is being hosted in the cloud. And you know, UBS is driving really this transformation of becoming more agile, uh, delivering better and better solutions using data and AI uh, to really strengthen their business and transform the value that they can provide to their clients. And we're incredibly uh, uh, pleased to be a partner that's been in, uh, key to enabling that experience. Now in this talk, I'm gonna go ahead and highlight a couple of the great innovations that we're delivering this week at Build. Uh, and have some amazing uh, talks that you can go ahead and watch uh, that go deeper about each of them. Uh, and I'm gonna give you kind of a slice of just some of the great uh, sessions uh, that you can check out uh, as part of this conference. Let's start by talking about some of the latest innovations uh, we're delivering with our developer tools and cloud. As I mentioned earlier, Microsoft has the most comprehensive tools and platforms for developers to use. Uh, as well as the teams they're on to, to leverage to code, collaborate, and ship solutions from anywhere. You know, our tools have integrated collaboration capabilities so that you can work across a team, so that you can have uh, your entire team collaborate securely together. And you can use your favorite languages, open source frameworks, uh, to, to make sure that, that you can leverage the full ecosystem that's out there, uh, regardless of your platform or choice. And you can build, test, and deploy all of your code uh, to the cloud uh, using the great set of GitHub capabilities and Visual Studio capabilities that we provide. We just released a new version of Visual Studio 2019 uh, that we call the 16.10 release. This includes a bunch of great productivity enhancements for .NET and C++ developers, uh, enhanced Git tooling support, as well as improved container and Azure tooling features. Uh, including support for our new Azure API management, all built into the IDE. We also announced the, uh, the new version of Visual Studio, uh, with what we're calling Visual Studio 2022. This is going to be the first 64-bit native version of Visual Studio, uh, which will bring a lot of great uh, performance and scalability improvements to developers working on large, complex projects. .NET 6 marks the completion of our journey to really unify the .NET ecosystem. Uh, and .NET 6 Preview 4 is now available, uh, which unifies the .NET platform while also introducing new innovations like C Sharp 10, uh, .NET MAUI, and Blazor uh, that enable you to build cross-platform uh, native mobile and desktop apps for Android, Mac OS, iOS, and Windows. Uh, all using a single code base. And definitely want to encourage you to check out some of the great sessions and upgrade to these latest editions because uh, they really provide a tremendous amount of new capabilities and power. And you know, what's great is that Visual Studio and .NET are the perfect complements to this larger developer set of capabilities. And combined, Visual Studio, GitHub, and Azure in particular enable developers to focus on building apps and not have to worry about all of the infrastructure that's required in order to run them. With Visual Studio GitHub and Azure, you get a seamless experience that enables you to focus on your code and deploy and get it to the cloud using your favorite languages and platforms of your choice, 
um, so that you can, again, code, collaborate, and deploy applications securely across the team uh, anywhere you want. Now, I talked about a bunch of great improvements and enhancements uh, that we're releasing at Build this week. Uh, and there's a phenomenal talk uh, by Amanda Silver, Donovan Brown, and Julie Strauss. And definitely encourage you to watch that session to learn more about our latest innovation for developer tools in cloud and go a lot deeper on all the great technology I just walked through. So that's a little bit about developer tools in cloud. Let's actually now switch gears and talk about building cloud native applications. Now, one of the things that's, that's great about Azure is the power of all the built-in uh, developer capabilities uh, that we deliver as a service on it. Uh, and we literally have uh, literally hundreds now of services on Azure that you can take advantage of as a developer uh, to build great applications. And some of these, I know a lot of people that are watching things like web apps uh, and serverless functions and logic apps, you know, you're very familiar with uh, and they're used now by literally millions of developers around the world today. Yesterday, we announced a preview of uh, some great new set of Azure capabilities, which are gonna now allow you to take these same services that you've used inside Azure and build applications that can now use them and run anywhere uh, across, whether it's on Azure, across an on-premises environment, including you know, bare metal as well as VMware deployments, as well as even other clouds like AWS and GCP. Uh, in fact, any Kubernetes cluster uh, around the world, again, running in any environment, uh, can now be connected through what we call Azure Arc, and you can now take advantage of these services on top of that cluster as well. Uh, what this means is that you can now innovate faster by using our built-in Azure application services uh, and, you know, again, have this beautiful model where you can focus on your code and not have to worry about the underlying infrastructure that it's running on top of. Uh, and this means you don't have to kind of trade off productivity for portability. You can now run it everywhere. Uh, it also means that you now have a higher level set of capabilities that you could run on top of Kubernetes. Uh, so you get some of the, the flexibility that Kubernetes provides as well as the portability that it provides. Um, but an even richer set of capabilities that enable you as a developer to build applications faster. Uh, and then this also gives you a great way as a developer uh, to work with teams on the operations side to be able to run and monitor the applications uh, in a multi-cloud approach. And again, the, the power of all this is through something we call Azure Arc, which is a key element of our multi-cloud hybrid strategy. And what Azure Arc provides all up is this notion that you can go ahead and do cloud operations anywhere for your cloud applications. Uh, and I talked on the previous slide about how you can use all of our application services. Azure Arc also allows you to manage infrastructure. And in previous uh, developer conferences, we've also uh, announced and now support the ability to run, for example, our database services as well on top of Arc. And the combination of all of this gives you just tremendous uh, flexibility uh, to, again, build solutions that have ultimate port uh, portability and can be used everywhere. And with Azure Arc, you have a single pane of glass for management and operations and monitoring. Uh, you can apply Azure policy and governance controls as part of it. Uh, and Azure Arc works with any CNCF conformant Kubernetes cluster, uh, which again makes it possible to use Azure application services, data services, and infrastructure services uh, literally anywhere uh, to accelerate your innovation faster. Gabe uh, Monroy has a great talk uh, here at Build this week called Build Cloud Native Applications That Run Anywhere, uh, which is a great session where you can learn more about um, all of these announcements uh, and um, really start taking advantage of it today. Now, I talked about cloud native apps and our developer tools. Um, obviously, one of the key ingredients of all of those apps is the data that they store and the AI that works against it. And uh, with Microsoft Azure and our overall uh, cloud platform, we now provide you know, an incredibly rich set of services and capabilities uh, that enable you to do this. And this week, we're going to talk about some of our great latest innovations. You know, one of the services that's been very differentiated uh, for Azure over the last couple of years uh, that developers really love is our Azure Cosmos DB database. Azure Cosmos DB is our fast, ultra low latency, NoSQL database. Um, it's designed for single millisecond response time. Uh, it supports a wide variety of different developer APIs, uh, including popular ones like 
Cassandra and MongoDB uh, and Gremlin Graph and others. Uh, and it you know, enables you to build petabyte scale applications that can even run across multiple simultaneous Azure regions um, in an active, active, active uh, or more configuration. And we have customers today that are literally scaling to trillions of transactions per day um, against a single database to support customers all over the globe. Uh, in particular, we announced the general availability of our Cosmos DB serverless support. Uh, with serverless, uh, developers no longer need to kind of provision a database that you're always billed for, regardless of how it's used. Uh, instead, with serverless capabilities, uh, we only pay you, uh, you only pay us uh, based on the actual database operations that you perform. Uh, and so there's no minimum charge or capacity planning required. Instead, you basically just pay for the request against your database service. Um, which you know, can be provides tremendous flexibility, obviously, in your pricing and also uh, how you can scale your application. We also this week uh, introduced our new integrated cache support for Cosmos DB, which can boost performance by up to 300% on your workload uh, and reduce your cost by up to 96% uh, for heavy read uh, workloads inside your application. We also announced some new enterprise-grade security capabilities, uh, much richer role-based access control support, as well as something we call always encrypted, uh, which is particularly um, uh, important in this ultra-secure world uh, that we now live in. And we've made some really great free tier enhancements. Um, and that's been something a lot of people have often asked for in the past, which is, hey, I love Cosmos DB, but you know, can you help me get started uh, with it? Uh, without having to pay a lot of money. And the great thing with Cosmos DB now is you get a free uh, 25 gigabyte database uh, that can do a thousand requests per second um, with no cost ever. Uh, and you can use that to uh, start building applications uh, faster and easier than ever before. For Azure AI, we're also making some great announcements this week that enable developers to build AI applications even faster. Uh, lots of great new improvements with our Azure Applied AI services. Uh, these are kind of pre-built AI models that you can leverage. So if you want to do document processing or customer service or extract content from a document, uh, all those capabilities are built in uh, for you as a developer to call as an API. Great improvements to PyTorch, uh, including PyTorch Enterprise support, uh, which enables even more uh, capabilities for custom AI models that you want to build. Uh, and with our Azure Arc enabled support, like you saw with our application services earlier, you can now use our Azure ML services everywhere, uh, including in on-premises environments or even on other clouds. And then lastly, we got some great improvements with our bot support, uh, with our Azure bot service uh, that enable you to build even more interactive and better uh, services that you can deliver to end users. Definitely re uh, recommend uh, Rohan Kumar's uh, great talk, which is called uh, Deliver uh, new intelligent cloud native applications by harnessing the power of data and AI session uh, that we're having this week, uh, where you can learn more about all these great enhancements and more. Now, a lot of the, what I've covered so far is, um, you know, from a core platform perspective and in the Azure uh, bucket of the Microsoft Cloud. Now, one of the things that we've also seen uh, this past year has been obviously as people have pivoted to work more from home or in a hybrid way. Uh, the need to collaborate in a remote fashion across organizations and across teams. Uh, and one of the key you know, applications uh, that's been essential for kind of connecting all these employees and all these people around the world has been Microsoft Teams. Uh, and there's now more than 145 million daily active people uh, that use Microsoft Teams uh, in a pretty essential way uh, to uh, run their businesses. And part of what it makes Teams powerful is not just that you can do video conferencing or, or text chats, but you can also integrate applications as part of that overall experience and leverage the Microsoft Cloud as really a collaborative application development experience uh, that you can integrate your business processes and your applications within. And with the Microsoft Power Apps offering, that we have, professional developers can also now accelerate delivering workflows and the delivery of business applications to all 145 million of these users. And you know, we see increasingly uh, the need for you to be able to kind of build these types of business applications and asynchronous collaboration scenarios faster. 
And part of what we're trying to do with the Microsoft Cloud Up, uh, Cloud All Up, is enable professional developers to work with, say, business analysts inside an enterprise, as well as people building um, simple automation workflows or front-end experiences, and combine all of this into solutions uh, that can be deployed quickly and leveraging um, all the collaboration capabilities that are built in as part of the Microsoft Cloud. And we now have a really great development workflow that enables that. And just to kind of illustrate how easy it is for you to build these types of solutions, uh, I'd like to kind of walk through uh, one great example, uh, which is Toyota North America. Uh, Toyota you know, wanted to build solutions uh, that enable their thousands of employees around the world to do quality check deliveries in the aftermarket accessory business uh, within the vehicles that they sell. And they wanted to be able to do it uh, using power apps and the power of Teams uh, and be able to leverage an Azure-based backend. And it, this solution is now being in, used by all Toyota dealerships uh, as part of the vehicle um, delivery and accessory business. Let's see how they built it. So the great thing is they were able to go into Visual Studio and just say, file new project and create a web API using the standard .NET uh, web API support that the developers were already familiar with. Uh, they could create APIs, they could call Cosmos DB or SQL or other data services. And then when they're ready, they could either right click and publish that API in Azure or set up a GitHub action and do it automatically using a CI CD process. Now, once they publish that API and they used Azure API management in order to uh, publish it into a catalog, the beauty is all of the business analysts inside Toyota, as well as other developers, could basically consume it uh, using Power Apps and inside Teams, and all in a very secure, easy way. And so, for example, here uh, inside Power Apps, you'll notice that that Toyota API that we just built in .NET uh, now surfaces on the toolbox. And that developer is now uh, able to go ahead and very easily data bind UI elements inside a Power App. Uh, they can go ahead and call those APIs inside the cloud. And you can see here, this is a nice sort of Excel-like macro uh, language. So this can even be used by, say, a business analyst that maybe is not a professional developer in order to call that API that was built by a professional developer in a very easy, seamless way. And then once an application is built, uh, they can just go ahead and right-click and publish it into Microsoft Teams. It's just a single click, and now it can be deployed uh, to anyone inside uh, a dealership or across the Toyota organization. Uh, this is an example of that application now running inside Microsoft Teams on a Windows desktop. But the beauty is it also works on any device that Teams is on. So, for example, if I'm on my phone, I can just pull up the app drawer to find the app, and then I can go ahead and activate it. And so this is a great way I can literally roll out applications across any tablet, phone, or desktop device on any operating system, uh, and now connect end users directly to that API that's running on Azure, you know, again, all through the power of Power Apps. And this is sort of a great example of how you can start to build really interactive, very fast development workflows uh, that really enable you to deliver amazing value um, in a digital transformation kind of way to an entire organization using Teams. This week at Build, we're also announcing a whole bunch of new capabilities um, for professional developers to also target teams uh, using procedural code as well. Uh, and you can do that through our SDKs. You, uh, and we now have great SDKs built into Visual Studio and some really great tooling support that we're delivering. We also now have uh, developer API support for the Power Platform. So you can use C Sharp or your other languages in order to code against the Power Platform as well. Uh, and a bunch of great capabilities around collaboration and being able to set up meetings and do voice um, through our Azure communication services and teams, uh, all built into your applications that you code. Jeff Teeper has a great talk that you can also watch this week to learn more about all these innovations and how they come together to enable you to use the Microsoft Cloud and our development tools to build amazing applications and solutions. Now, the last thing I thought I'd talk about uh, is around how you can build uh, applications inside Azure, not just for, say, employees inside your organization or for customers uh, that are end users, but also package them up into business applications uh, or SaaS-based delivered solutions uh, that you can then sell both to end users as well as to other businesses and deliver in a SaaS-based way. 
And part of what makes the Microsoft Cloud powerful, as I talked about earlier, is the rich set of capabilities that we deliver, not just with Azure, but with things like Office 365 and Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform. And what's great is, is as a developer, uh, you don't always have to start with, uh, say, a blank Kubernetes cluster or a blank VM. You can actually start by taking advantage of some of these built-in developer components, like I talked about just a moment ago with Teams and with the Power App Platform, uh, when you're building your solutions in your applications. And this allows you, for example, if you want a full customer service solution, to start with Dynamics 365 and then build custom UI or custom workflows around it uh, and be able to leverage an incredibly rich set of CRM capabilities that we provide uh, that you can then adapt as part of your uh, SaaS-based solution. And definitely encourage developers, if you haven't already uh, looked at all these components, to start looking at some of these bigger components and some of these bigger building blocks that you can leverage. Because they're just like you can leverage APIs and libraries in the past, this allows you to do even more and deliver even more value uh, to your customers. Uh, and we not only provide kind of horizontal support like CRM, but we're increasingly, we're also providing richer and richer industry support. Uh, and so this allows us to deliver features uh, that have even kind of um, more sophisticated capabilities and components tailored for a specific industry. Uh, and we now have five industry clouds with built-in vertical industry components uh, that you can leverage as part of your solutions. Make sure to check out Charles Lamana's uh, great talk on build differentiated SaaS apps with the Microsoft Cloud, uh, which is a session this week that goes much deeper into how you can leverage all of this. Uh, and again, build amazing applications uh, as part of your solutions. So we've covered a lot of territory in this presentation and you know, hopefully you see just sort of the richness of some of the great new capabilities that we're releasing this week and how you can use them to build amazing solutions. Uh, and as I talked about, you know, there's some great sessions you can watch to go even deeper and learn more. No other uh, cloud provides the depth and breadth of what Microsoft provides. And between this cloud and our developer tools, uh, you can really build some just phenomenal solutions. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what you build with it. Coming up next, don't miss Scott Hanselman's uh, developer session and the rest of our day two Microsoft into focus sessions. Uh, and I hope you have a great build and a great rest of the week. Thanks so much. Oh. Ugh. Another Teams meeting. Dude, then don't. Go to Seattle. I can do that? Yeah. You're the world's okayest programmer. Uh, yeah. Hi, right, whenever you're ready. 4C with cheese, please. All right, first window. Thank you. Second dose? Yep. All right, last name. Hanselman. And then relax your arm. One, two, three. That was it? And that was it. Magical. Right. Thank you. I really wanted it to be in a theater. Yeah. Hey, friends. Hey, Scott. Hey, Hi. Scott. It going? took you long enough. Thank you, Leslie. I was going to say, it's so nice to see your partially obscured faces. I am fully vaccinated, as I know you all are. Huh? Doesn't that feel great? Yeah. yeah. This better be good. I had to put on something other than sweatpants for this, so. Yes, it is a year without pants. I do appreciate that. Uh -huh. Um. We rented the space last year, and if we didn't use it, I still have to pay for it. So that's why we're here. No, we're here because of energy. Leslie, I cannot do another Teams call. I cannot do another whole conference on a Teams call. It's stressing me out. I love Teams, but seriously. Scott, I am excited to be here. It's awesome that we're doing this, but this honestly could have been an email. Technically, you're right. But still, we're here, and I'm excited to be here. Hey, Scott, quick, quick question, though. Why are they here? Oh, well, he hangs out with me everywhere I go. Behind the scenes. It was part of the package deal. When you get the theater, you get like people to follow you around. I want the energy. I need to document all this stuff because uh, nobody here takes notes. Okay, cool. Can we do this? Yeah, let's do it. All right, come on. It's review time. Okay. Build. Let's all do right. it. All right. Downstairs, downstairs. Could you care? Do people need to be enthusiastic as they you walk down? You should at least try to care. Okay. It I mean, is your job. All right. <laughs> all right. Got a whiteboard. Go to energy. 
A lot of positivity in the room here, people. What? There's like a very fancy surface that you could be using instead of mm -hmm. the whiteboard that's Is that in front of it. plugged in? Oh, cool. All right. As long as we talk about Visual Studio. Well, I mean, we have to talk about Windows, too. Like, the stuff we've been doing with Windows is awesome. But there's also uh, WSL. Talk about some Linux action and Visual which, Studio. Which runs on Windows. That's true. Focus, focus, focus. I want to figure out what we're going to talk about at Build here. I think we should be talking about Windows. I think the last two years have been awesome for Windows, okay. and telling that story is super, super great. So uh, Visual Studio is really cool, especially Visual Studio 2022. That's coming out. That's great. And we got WSL that we can play around with. Okay. GitHub WSL. productivity. Who doesn't love productivity? Okay. All right. Megan On is in that. the slides making him awesome. I like that. Thank you for that. We should talk about the faster inner loop with GitHub code spaces. Uh, inner That's loop. Okay. hot. So inner loop. Inner loop means like you write some code and you see the change, and you write some code and you see the change, and it happens really fast, right? I mean, yeah. .NET's good. We should talk about .NET, right? Hey, but did you get the inner loop with code spaces? Okay, code space. I'm getting overwhelmed now. There's a lot. Oh, here. don't forget Hang about on. hot reload. Hot reload. Talk about Python. Oh, no. Megan, are you following any oh, of this? Oh, have you heard of Playwright? You should be using Playwright. Maybe this was a bad Got idea. It? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully, Megan will be able to turn this into something. Ooh, ooh, some magic. Very nice. Good job, Appreciate Megan. that. Wow, Nicely yeah, done. Nice. All right, cool. It. I'm going to just draw everything and let her do all the work. All right, sweet. Cool. So, to recap, I heard us say we can build anything with Windows. That's going to be cool. Uh, we'll show WSL as well. Uh, productive inner loop. That was good. Uh, we use Visual Studio. We use GitHub. Ooh. Dig it. Dig it. I like it. And then, of course, uh, any language, any developer, any platform, code and language of your choice. Sound good? Looks yeah, good. That sounds great. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So I've actually got an idea that could cover a couple of these. So I could just show my, my idea demo real quick? Yeah, All right. Let's do it. Okay. All right, rock on. All right, so we all know that Windows is the best box for developers, and you can run Linux on Windows now, which is really cool. So it's also the best box for any developer, for anyone doing anything. So I'm going to take this machine, uh, you know, which theoretically has nothing set up on it already, OK? And then what I'm going to do is I'll go down here to the Start menu. And I'm going to type CMD, and I will pop up the command line here in Windows. You can set the Windows terminal as hey, the. Hey, uh, Can't see your screen. Why are you here? All right, is that better? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go into the Start menu. See, I got PowerShell, I got the Command Comp, I got Windows PowerShell. And what I can actually do is I can do a hotkey here, and I'm going to open up PowerShell in a separate tab, and I'll go ahead and maximize this. Now take a look at the prompt, right? You see how the prompt is all kind of blinged out? I'm using this thing called Oh My Posh. And I've got like a cool, um, uh, cool fonts and glyphs. I'm going to go to GitHub, and I'll go to Hanselman.com. And then let me go up one, I'll go down into my podcast. So I've got two different things here. And you notice that I've actually got the GitHub branch, I've got the version of .NET. It's all like set up there with the cool glyphs and everything. So now I'm going to run Winget search, and I'll look for like, let's say, .NET. And then when I do that, it's going to go and search the catalog here that Winget has. And you use Winget you know, to set up all your, your machine. There you go. See, I got .NET at the top right there. And then we'll go Winget search, and we'll look for like uh, Node.js. And now we look there. I've got Node.js. So I can go and get all the software that I want. And then I can even, check this out, I'm going to switch over to a JavaScript that I made. That's like a list of the stuff that I want to have on my machine. right? So I want to have Git, I want to have Power Toys and stuff. So I put those in this JSON file. And then I can go back, and I can say Winget import. And I'll say set up new box. And then I hit Enter, and it goes and installs all the stuff that I uh, would need to get that particular machine set up exactly the way that I want it. That's cool. Now, if I hold down Alt, check this out, I'm going to hold down Alt, and I can open split screen. So I've got Ubuntu on the right, and I've got on the left Windows. And I've actually got the my podcast website. I moved my podcast website over to .NET 5. So we've got, there you go, there's HDOP. This proves that it's like Linux, right? Uh, so we've got Ubuntu on the right, we've got uh, Windows on the left, and I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, switch over to Visual Studio. Okay, so here I've got my, my GitHub log, and you can see my branches and all this stuff. It's all integrated. This is part of the new stuff that we've got in Visual Studio for GitHub support. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take that Ubuntu instance that we had before, and I'm going to just zoom in here at the top. See, it says WSL2. I can run it under IIS, or I can run it under WSL2, and I can actually hit F5, and I'm going to start a debug session. I'm running Visual Studio 2019 on Windows, but I'm actually debugging it inside Linux. Now, look, look, look. Look, see where it says user share.net? It doesn't say C colon backslash program files or whatever. That's literally using the .NET that I have installed inside of Ubuntu. So then I pop up Edge. Check it out. Localhost 5001. That's Edge on Windows running on my web for my website that's running on .NET on Linux. 
A little bit of inception, huh? Isn't that sweet? Whoa. Leslie, are you teamsing me? I am literally right here. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, I do that a lot. That's all well and good, but I think I can do you one better. Mind if I steal the keyboard for oh, a bit? By, by all means, here you go. Thank you. So you were talking about how you can run your apps on the server side in Linux, right? But you know you can do that with the client side too, right? So let's go locate the Ubuntu window and I can show you. And let's open up GIMP. And as you can see, like, look, the window, it looks exactly like a Linux window. The cursor's changed. So we can take that even a step further and in Visual Studio under the web browser, let's change it to be the Linux build of Microsoft Edge. So instead of just running your app on the server side in Linux, uh, I can also run that app on the client side as well. I'll believe it when I see it, Leslie. Uh-huh. Well, y you will believe. So here we go. All right. Getting the local host all booted up. Yeah. Yep, there's my website. Yep. Cool. Yep, there's the website. As you can see, Tux the Penguin is chilling with the Edge logo here. Well, I don't know. It still kind of looks like Edge. Uh, seriously? Okay, so if you don't believe me yet, uh, I can actually type in Edge version. And there you go. And there's Linux. Pretty sweet, huh? I stand corrected. Thank you. I also use Linux uh, in the cloud, so like GitHub Actions and places like that. I want to run my continuous integration stuff in the cloud. Can we do that as well? Yeah, I got you covered. So have you heard of Playwright by any chance? I have heard of Playwright. It's new. Yeah, so it's a cool testing library that lets you automate your applications across multiple different kinds of browsers. So I have added Playwright to the top of my code here, and I've got a lot going on, but specifically, we're gonna check to see if the app that I want to run and test is in a Docker container or a build server. If it is, then I can load up a headless browser. So the browser won't actually appear, but it'll still run those tests. But in this case, uh, I'm not using a container, so we're just going to boot up a non-headless browser, and I expect the browser to physically appear in that case. Okay. I wanted to condense in a helper function that I have here called verify text. And that's something that I'm going to have to apply to every test that I've written. I've written at least 10. Haven't checked lately, but it's a lot. It's kind of the same thing multiple times. Go to the page, look yep. at the text, go to the page, yep. look at the text. Check it's to like... see that the links work, check to see that the yeah. title's correct. Integration testing. Exactly. Cool. In this case, I want to make my code a little cleaner and less repetitive. So let's change the await page line to my verify text and destination tag. So okay. I only it's have a little to helper function, line. not a playwright thing, but a helper function exactly. that you made yourself. Okay. Yep. So and now we what? Watch you do this forty times. That's exciting. Uh, hold Leslie. your horses. You know, watch the magic happen. I got you. So let's go ahead and do verify text a couple more times. Believe in the process. We're almost there, and okay, so if you notice, there's some little ellipses here. Let's zoom in, and that refers to IntelliCode. So IntelliCode now can infer what I'm about to do next based off of all of my past boring, repetitive behaviors Ooh. and give me a suggestion as to what line of code I want to have refactored So next. it's like figured out that there's a refactoring that doesn't exist and it made it. Exactly, and it's letting me apply it to everything that matches that same pattern, which is great. So that saved me a lot of time and a lot of tedium. And you cleaned up all my unit tests. Thank you for I doing sure that. I sure did. You're Appreciate very welcome. That. Okay. Once again, in the Linux terminal, we're going to go ahead and do .NET test. And now all of those Playwright tests start up. Now, this is not running in a build server. Nope. So I would expect a browser to pop up. Right. So this the browser, is not headless. Exactly. This is not headless. Therefore, it should be here. There it is. Voila. Look, I'm not even touching. Just sit back and watch the test run. In this case, 23 of them run <laughs> <Nice>. successfully. <Okay. laughs> GitHub Actions actually has a Playwright option too. So I added the same stuff in GitHub Actions and it will do the very same thing that we just did in Visual Studio. There it is. Magic. I like it. We will uh, we'll use that demo and it built. Is that cool? Yeah. And you know, it's not even just a demo because we have game developers like Blizzard, like Diablo Blizzard, using our tools to make their games. How sweet is that? That is basically making us game developers, so. Uh, so we actually have video footage of that. All right, cool, where is it? I believe it's in your OneDrive last time I checked. Okay, I will go up and I will beep boop pop boop beep boop. We at Blizzard develop our servers on Windows, but we actually build and deploy them on Linux. When we experience a crash in our environment, uh, we like to grab the core dump and figure out what went wrong. 
The actual goal was to be able to use Visual Studio, which is the tool set we're all familiar with and we love. The idea of doing that has always been unattainable. We are able to develop a solution, validate the solution with Blizzard. It democratizes that whole process. It's incredible. Good stuff. All right, I dig it. We can put that in there. We'll find a place for that. Let's put that in the keynote, too. Mm -hmm. cool. Video games are always a great buzzword. I to love have. it. I, I, and seriously, I will crush you later because I literally have like, oh, my it's Diablo. On. I, it's seasonal right now, and I'm, I'm crushing it in Diablo right now. All right, so check this out. There's actually a blog post that goes into depth about this, about how they do the debugging of their Linux core dumps using Visual Studio. There's cool screenshots of what's coming in Diablo 4, as well as like architectural explanations. This is all written by Erica on our team, and it talks about how they go and use this stuff. It's pretty sweet, and you can check out that blog post right there. Uh, let us recap. All right, so starting with Megan's slides, we've got build anything on Windows, blah, 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 marketing, marketing. Uh, improvements in Terminal and Winget. We set up a machine. We use the new terminal. We set it as default. Linux app development, very nice, uh, with WSL2 running Linux on Windows and also Linux GUI apps. And cross-platform UI testing with Playwright. That was hot. Dig it. Nicely done. Um, I got a couple other ideas I just want to run by you all. Um, I got this cool thing on, um, on Kickstarter. It's, it's a, called a LumiCube. It's a Raspberry Pi in a cube. Lights up. Super cool. Hey, I think, Scott. What? Um, can we go through some of the other topics instead of doing the toy thing? Okay, fine, fine. Maybe not that. That's fine. Uh, I do have, uh, however, if you want to be more official, I've got a, a brief Hello World diagram that is in cloud <laughs> native. So we can go a little bit here and just discuss Hello World in the cloud, right? We just about, take about 45 minutes and run through this real quick? All right, cool. Let's do that. Uh, you want to go check out some hot reload stuff? Yeah, dude. Yeah. I think I want to get out of here for a sec. Good luck. Okay. All right. Well, you, we're, we're, we're doing this yeah, cloud thing. Okay, so... It all starts with a guy in a red shirt. Okay, lucky break. <laughs> anyway, I had some hot reload stuff. I was thinking about yeah. putting together a demo for. I think that would be really cool to talk about. I'll show you what I got so far, and maybe we can figure something yeah, out. Sure. Okay. Hey, did y'all say you needed a hot reload demo? I got a cool one right here. Abel, what are you doing here? What? Of course I was going to be here. This is Build, the premier conference for developers. Wasn't going to miss this for the world. You're welcome. Show us what you got. All right, check this out. So I'm going to bring this up in Visual Studio. And here's the source for this application. And this right here is where we build out our scenes. So I'm going to use the update model view method. And this is where I'm going to demo. First thing, let's snap this to the left and then launch our application using the debugger. So here it comes. It's going to initialize. And next, I'll go ahead and click on OK. And here's our Minecraft clone, right? You can move around. You can look around. Notice there's an independent light source as well. And it's revolving around independently, casting shadows. So this is all written in C Sharp and .NET 5. Pretty cool. So let's snap this to the right-hand side. And now we've got our app running in the debugger. And we know it's running in the debugger. We can do things like zoom in, and we can see how much memory it's using in real time, how much CPU it's using, right? It's in mm -hmm. the debug session. I'm going to go ahead and make some changes to the code. Now, before this turns into a big, giant thing, you got to bring mm -hmm. your app down. Oh, just a pain, right? Of course. So much easier now. Check this out. You just type in your changes. So I'm going to go ahead and type in the time, which is the current time in milliseconds, to the create rotation Z method. Next, we'll go ahead and go to debug and apply code changes. Now, this is super cool. When I go ahead and click this, notice that it doesn't stop the debugger, it doesn't rebuild, right? I click Apply Code Changes, and bam, it just picks up the Get changes automatically. That's super cool. Saves but so wait, there's more, right? Check this out. Let's make another change. I'll remove it. I'll press Control S to save, and bam, it automatically picks up those code changes. How cool is that? That right? is so cool. Yeah. How much really? time I lose just having to stop and start? I know, because before, what did we have to do? We, we would have to bring our debugger down. We'd have to make the code changes. We'd have to rebuild our applications, fire up our debugger. Hopefully, yeah. our, it remembers where our breakpoints are, right? Yeah. Now, you just make the change. So this right here will save you so much time. This needs to go and build. Yeah, absolutely. And this developers, they need to run, right, and not walk towards their latest installation of Visual Studio and check out hot reloads. Yeah, I gotta say hot reload is pretty hot.
<laughs> Super cool. Well, I'm glad you guys liked it. Let me go ahead and send it to you so you'll have it. You can show Scott. Oh, also, I wanted to send you this other video of this new loading thing we're doing with Official Studio 2022. Oh my God, it is so incredibly cool. This is specifically for what? Gigantic projects, right? It loads it so much faster now. Let me send that to you as well. That's Jeez. gonna be really useful. Yeah. You show up out of nowhere and you come with some of the best demos. <laughs> Get out of here. That's what I do, man. <laughs> We should definitely go tell Scott about this. Let's go. All right. See y'all. I think we should recap this. Let me start okay. over from scratch. I'm going to erase everything and just explain the whole deal to you again. Hey, y'all. What have you been up to? You missed some great stuff. Uh, uh, I thought it was, it. it was, there was a lot of conversation. We saw an awesome demo that Abel showed us. Abel was here. Yeah. yeah. Did not say hi. It's not interesting in that, Scott. Come on. It was an awesome demo on Hot Reload. Was it spicy? It was pretty spicy. Okay, if you say it was spicy and hot, then we'll put it into the demo. In addition to Hot Reload, he also shared this cool looking video on Visual Studio 2022 that we should check out. Oh, okay, let's check it out. Sweet. So this is a huge solution that has lots of files, and usually that would take a pretty long time to load up when you're booting up Visual Studio. 300,000 files? Yeah, but I mean, look at that, the 2022 version, it's already up and running. Oy vey, okay. Two, two and hours. a half minutes there. Yep. 2019, the product that we love. Yep. Uh, still going. This is 64 bit though, right? Yeah, that's 64 bit. Yeah, much faster too. 300,000 files. That is a lot of files. That's bananas. Yep. I like it. All right, let's put that in. And come on, we don't want to forget my cube that I was talking about earlier. It's going to be hot. It's I think we could lunch. probably yeah, integrate it with. Lunch. Let's go get lunch. Ah, right. Always a bridesmaid. This is so disrespectful. I have ideas. Hey, lunch. Yay. Sorry, Scott. Microsoft bought me double meat. It's so good. It's better when someone else pays for it. I think it's ethical. Mm. This is ninety-five percent ethical. It's Nelson. Don't just don't say anything. Hey, Scott. Hi. Hi, sir. How are you? I'm doing great. So I know you're in the middle of brainstorming your keynote, but have you had a chance to think about privacy? Yeah, privacy is important. I mean, I know Microsoft runs on trust. I've done all the training. Uh, I definitely don't want to go down the wrong road. So I've, I've tried to put as much thought as I can into privacy and security. That's right. Microsoft values privacy and security to mean trust with our customers. I mean, this stuff is serious, Scott. Have you been taking time to consider ethics, uh, globalization? One serving of barbacoa instead of three. Uh, I recognize that triple meat may have been an overreach on my part. Scott, I better not hear about you downloading a key generator to access third-party software on a Microsoft device. I will not be doing that anymore. I appreciate your feedback, sir. Hey, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. I'm having... We're going, into, we're going into a tunnel! Wait, Scott? Hey, Scott, you might need to update the software on your Microsoft Surface if that's what you're calling me from. Nelson, man. Uh, uh, I mean, me. like, he's right, but, I mean, I'm doing all the, I do my training, man. He's all up in my business. All right, uh, after lunch, where were we at? Actually, I think this is a great time to look at the GitHub Codespaces demo. I have a great demo, mm -hmm. which we totally need to see. Is that on your laptop? Yeah, it's on my laptop. I can hook it up. Okay, you want it here? No, actually, I want it to be theater style. Um, yeah, it's on. Uh, this was totally worth it. Scott, you were all about positivity like two I minutes am. ago. I apologize. Okay. You see this GitHub repo of mine, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I am going to get you into a code space. Okay. Now, what is a code space, you ask? Well, it's an awesome dev environment in the cloud. It comes pre-built with all these dependencies that you don't even have to care about. You can literally get started from your GitHub repo, and you're right into a VS Code experience in the browser. So I'm right into VS Code? Well. It is VS Code with all its, all its bells and whistles, but mm -hmm. it's more, right? Yes, of course, I can go to files and open it, and like, let's see, I can look at index.js, let me open it, I'll show you it has all the syntax highlighting, all the nice stuff that we're used to, right? Mm -hmm. But I can do more. I can go into my very nice and happy extensions marketplace <laughs> and download my favorite extensions, which is 
you know, live share yes, as you work on course. it. Yes, of course. Well, you can't hate on collaboration, Scott. No, it's good. You know. So you're actually adding extensions, but you're not in VS Code. No, you're I'm adding not. it into the environment? I am adding that into the code space. Ah, yes, exactly. Okay. And I can use it just like I would in VS Code. Mm -hmm. Like I told you, it's more than that. Mm -hmm. I'm able to actually run and build this code without doing any setup. You see, I'm running NPM. Run dev now, okay? And right, you'll right. see that this is getting built. You didn't see me install anything. Yeah. Well, you're on slash workspaces, slash haikus, build. That's not your C That's drive. That's not local, right? Okay. The port got forwarded. You see that my app is active. It's cool. on. Now, let me go back to the code space, and I'll show you something really cool. Now, if I want to add this port in a reusable way into the code space where nobody has to do any of this setup, right? Sure. I can take advantage of these awesome configuration templates that CodeSpaces has. We have tons of them, and you can customize. It's just like a starting point for you. This is obviously a Node.js app, so I'm going to use that Node.js one and going to like the default uh, Node version, and that's going to give me this uh, dev container.json file, which is this fancy way for you to update and customize your configurations. Now, mm -hmm. you saw me add LiveShare earlier as a VS Code extension. I can add that into my dev container.json, and that means that anybody who uses this code space, like on my team, will get it, right? Okay. And I can do the same thing for my port. I can name it something useful and then add it to the dev container.json, and then it's automatically over there always. Mm -hmm. And the reusability of this, right, like to just get started for anybody is awesome. Now, you might imagine, how do I make these changes in the best way possible? Mm -hmm. I can literally just rebuild that from right here. And I don't need to do anything. It's almost like just refreshing my browser. All the changes that I made to the container.json file that you saw. Oh, okay. So it's Just recycling the container. Yes. It's got all your extensions, your ports forwarded the way that you want it, and all your settings. And connects, and yeah. it's set. And there's your installed CodeSpace live share there. There okay, you can cool. see it. Let me run this app again, mm -hmm. right? And you already saw that I showed you the port and how it gets forwarded right. and built, Local and that's host, great. Uh, 3000. Yes. Cool. Yeah. But one of the other cool things is now, if you want to look at my work while I'm doing it, I can make this port public for you. I'm literally going to make it public right now, okay. and I'm going to team send it to you. All right, cool. Yeah, and then go on, All look right, at it. I'll go over there. It's magic. All right, that is your dog. Cool, so that's the website. So I see port 3000 yep. in the URL. It's turned into a public port. Yeah. And look at that. It's a code space. None of this is cloned on your local machine. None of that's happening. Okay. Now, this is the app, though. Can I see my own code space? Can I log in with my own? Yeah. Thing? So every GitHub repository can be a code space. You can start with a universal image. You can use template containers, or you can customize it. You can do whatever you want. It's really easy to get started and make it better as you go. I dig it. It's got a dog. It's got code spaces. I'm sold. That's a demo, too. Let's put that in. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and close the curtains. So we're feeling good about the inner loop. I like it. Dig it. Now, code in the language of your choice. I said it before. I didn't feel supported. I'm going to say it again that this cube, I've got this cube, and I think it's cool. Okay. okay? Just, be, dude, just. Come on, it's a cube, it's cool, it's lights. It's getting kind of late. Is the sun getting real low? Can we do this later? No, we're doing the cube, so okay. buckle up, Buttercup, it's happening. All right, so it's called a LumiCube, it's a Raspberry Pi inside, but what's neat about it is that I can code it with Python, right? We got really good Python support in Visual Studio Code. Uh, we can use PyLance, which is new and plugged into Visual Studio Code, so like, can I just show you this potential demo? That sounds All right. right. All right, cool, we'll do that, it's gonna be good. Let me sit down here. Get this thing figured out. I'm digging your sheep, man. You like the sheep? Yeah, I like the yeah, sheep. Yeah, that's e-sheep. You can get that in the in the store. Just nice. did. You got the e-sheep? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. good. You can make custom sheep. It's nice. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go into uh, Visual Studio Code. You see I've got Python. And I've also got PyLance, okay? PyLance adds some language server features to uh, Python. Now, the code that this cube uses is Python code. So, like, this right here is a, called a is Ripple. And uh, if I hover over one of the methods, you can see that I get that kind of cool document tip there. We, we don't have to go looking for documentation. We get that, that code completion info tip that pops up right there, which is pretty cool. Um, now, if I want to use a particular thing, like if I want to say, uh, let me see here, I don't know, time. Let's say I want to say time, okay? time dot, and then I could go and say auto import, kind of like usings in C Sharp or other languages, and boom, it automatically brings in import time, and then I hit time dot, you see, 
and it pops up all the different things that time potentially has, which is pretty cool. Gives you a lot more rich language service there for Python. You like that? So this is just a chunk of code that does a bunch of X, Y, Z type um, uh, things on the, in the different axes we've got on this particular cube. You know, it's it's pretty simple stuff, but it's kind of a ripply code here. Okay. Now I'm going to run this uh, this Python code here that's going to change the lights on the Lumi cube, which, uh, like I mentioned before, I got on a, uh, a Kickstarter. Now, actually, if I hover over set 3D here, you see how I get the rich documentation for that particular method pulled out by PyLance, which is pretty sweet. So I don't have to go back and forth and go and dig into how this particular thing works. Let's go ahead and run that. Ah, uh, see? Look, look, look. It's a disco in here. Isn't that cool? Right, so the, the whole thing lights up, right? You can do all kinds of stuff. It's got, like, G, um, what's it called? Gyroscopes and speakers and all kinds of stuff. It's not just lights, it's a whole thing, right? I need to use Python to do it, so I want to have as good of a feature as I can uh, in the rich language features that I get with, uh, with PyLance. Okay, so back to the, uh, the code here. That one is the Ripple code. I'm going to switch over to this Minecraft one. So the idea was, you know, you'd mentioned, I think it launched that uh, uh, Able, we did some kind of Minecraft thing, yeah. right? So maybe I could integrate that C Sharp Minecraft clone uh, with a Minecraft thing and turn that into a Minecraft block in real life. So if I open up this REST book here, which lets me make a REST API call, I'm actually going to post the code and the graphics and stuff from my Minecraft.json in this VS Code native notebook environment right here. So uh, this is kind of like Jupyter Notebooks, but it's the native notebook experience that's built into Visual Studio Code. So I can hit post. We just posted it. Okay, there we go. So I just posted the code to the LumiCube. And then if I push the button on the side here, where's the button? There you go. So like it's a Minecraft block, right? Uh -huh. Or it's like uh, that was supposed to be sand. That didn't really kind of work out. Uh, TNT. So I want to like integrate it with the Python, uh, the Python and the C sharp, so that like if you touch something in the Minecraft world, the physical block like leaps into the physical world, which I thought would be kind of hot. That's cool. kind of cool. That's I'm good. not going to uh -huh. lie. That's, yeah. That could be a thing. We could do a thing with that. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. Any language, any platform, Raspberry Pi, everybody loves a pie. Yep. Yeah. And I'm surprised you actually know how to code. Thank you for your low expectations. All right. I thought that was a good demo. Come on. Give me yeah, a little something. Agree. That's a cool demo. Thank you for your begrudging respect. All right. I think that covers code in the language of your choice, right? We did Python, Felicia had Node, Abel had C Sharp. We saw all kind of different things. We saw Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio 2019, Visual Studio 2022. That's pretty good coverage, right? I mean, we've got to feel good about that. In this demo, we saw the improved Python editing experience with PyLance, and then RESTbooks is kind of cool. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, I got to use my cube, which I carried all the way from Portland, which I thought was really can nice. Can I borrow the cube? Yeah. You can borrow the cube, and it's, they got a Kickstarter, so thank you for the small business that offered us that cube to play with. So that's cool. Um, and then if we look at like the whole day holistically, right, we covered WSL, we covered Visual Studio, we covered Linux, both graphical and otherwise. Uh, we did all the interloop stuff. We saw the AI-powered refactorings, which was hot, the new GitHub stuff in Visual Studio, and then all the language stuff that we just talked about. Yeah, that's great. Right? As rehearsals go, that was pretty good. Like, we could, we could totally come back tomorrow and do this, this, uh, this again. Well, we did everything already. Yeah, I thought we already killed it. Why not? Yeah. Well, so, We're you know. We're one-shot wonders. You are a one-shot wonder, Felicia. We do have uh, a couple camera folks here who were here to like, you know, take notes and watch everything. So we could theoretically ship this. Question is, would anyone notice and would I be fired? Uh, it, Guthrie's never going to watch this. Well, you're on the line. I don't really care. I think we try. I think we go for it. We ship this. We call it a keynote. And then I can go and I got other stuff. Yeah. I got yeah. stuff to do. Hallelujah. Let's yeah, okay. Uh, Scott, if we're going to ship this, could you just give a note to our audience at Build? Oh, hello there. I didn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, we're going to ship this because, uh, you know, developers like to, uh, to keep it dry, right? Don't repeat yourself. So yeah. we did it once. We did it awesome. We're going to call this the keynote. We appreciate you hanging around with us today, and we hope you have fun with the rest of Build and all the great both live and on-demand sessions.
All right, cool. Uh, even though we've been uh, inside all the day, well, socially distanced, fully vaccinated, check this out. Uh, as we pack up uh, from our friends at uh, Window Swap, it's other people's windows. Oh, that's really nice. Oh, this nice is cool. To feel outside. It is nice to feel outside. So each time you click it, you get a different window. So let's pack up and we'll enjoy the sounds and views of the outside. You know what? I'm actually going to go outside. You're going to actually go outside? Well, I'm going to stay here because it's just like outside. Later, Megan. Bye. That was good. Stealing that. <laughs> Am I just going to clean up by myself? Felicia Shah here with Seth Juarez and Scott Hanselman, who, by the way, did such a fabulous job. Oh my gosh, you were so good. Thank you very much. I was a little nervous. I, I thought you did a great job. <laughs> well, you know, I just try, I try. But you know, we also just saw Scott Guthrie get unplugged at home. What were the takeaways? So two takeaways for me, super quick, Cosmos DB free tier and serverless. And number two, PyTorch Enterprise. I love PyTorch, super awesome framework. I'm excited yeah, about the I'm now. honestly really amazed at how much we're integrating with all these ecosystems, enabling everybody. It's kind of cool to see. Yeah, in, uh, in my talk, I thought that you did a great demo on code spaces. And yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think just the ability to get bootstrapped in a dev environment, get going no matter what device you're on is pretty neat. Have you all been watching the bookshelves of the different vice presidents? I really feel like uh, I like a credibility bookshelf because Guthrie's read all of those books. I'm always zooming in and trying to figure out y'all are underplaying the amazingness of what y'all did because i was watching i'm like is this real is this not real it <laughs> is real i learned a bunch of stuff how'd you come up with this we just wanted to try to be as edutaining as possible right oh, build is a great hard. opportunity for people to learn and to be entertained so we try to do a little bit of both so we had a great time this is amazing thank you and great stuff by the way y'all and Microsoft Build can be full of surprises. We heard something wild happen during your rehearsal, Scott. Oh, wait, I don't, what? I don't know what it is. What is it? Okay, so we were setting up the virtual teams, getting everyone organized. And okay, I'll just roll the tape. We got it all on Teams. Let's so take exciting. a look. Exciting. Hey, friends, and welcome. It's so great that you're going to be a part of Into Focus this year, and I think that everybody who's supposed to be here is present. Oh, well, hang on a second. Hey, how are you guys? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Satya. Do you have a few minutes, then maybe we can have a question or two? I'm happy to answer questions. Why do you think we should democratize coding? Is that what you mean by citizen dev? More of the constituents being part of the journey is the way we're going to get the design right, the quality right, and the fit right. Where do you see AI playing a role in coding today? You're never going to replace human ingenuity, right? Most people think about AI. After all, AI does get created uh, by people. Uh, I feel like we, sh we shouldn't abdicate our control of AI, but AI can be of great assistance. I am curious about what advice would you share with us as we look to grow personally and professionally in the year ahead? not to wait for your next opportunity. And it sort of sometimes feels like I just tried to say it, but I've always felt, at least in my own context, I never felt that I was waiting for my next job to do my best work. Well, thank you so much for your time, sir. I'm not sure how we're gonna go back to rehearsals after this, but uh, this has been pretty <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Good luck. Did we surprise anybody? Do you feel pretty good, friends? That was amazing. Pantip, you're okay getting up at three in the morning? You still that awake? awesome. Yeah, I just feel woke up. <laughs> you feel woke up? <laughs> All right, appreciate y'all. Bye-bye. Cheers, Scott. Cool. Cheers, Scott. Bye. Cheers, Scott. Bye, Bye. Bye. Scott. Wow, that was such a cool surprise. Seeing Satya there? I wonder who else is coming. Oh, wait, it's Julia Lucent, CVP of Developer Division at Microsoft. Julia, it's so good to have you here. Thank you. So good seeing you. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited to have you here because I just have to know, I know you've been a developer in the past and now you lead the developer division. What excites you the most about this space? 
Well, I have been developer division and leading this space for a very long time, and I love the developer space because developers are always the forefront of technology innovation. Yeah. So when I think about what we're trying to help developers to do, we're really trying to help get developers worldwide and helping them to be successful at everything they do. Mm -hmm. And at Build this year, we're really focusing on the developer velocity theme. And if you think about it, all of the demo you just saw really you know, echoes that particular theme. So thinking about you know, helping developers build productively, mm -hmm. take your idea and turn that into code. If the great demos we showed in Visual Studio 2012 was how using AI to help you code even faster, the, the inner loop performance improvements, the hot reload demo. There's so many great stuff that we're delivering to help developers code even faster. Another great announcement build is that for Teams, how we're helping developers building Teams application faster mm -hmm. with the Microsoft Teams toolkit. So that's another capability we're delivering. I'm super excited. Mm -hmm. And then we also know developers, they're not working by themselves. Development is a team sport. Yep. So <laughs> GitHub is such a platform, a great global collaboration platform. So the entire team can come together and collaborate securely you know, on the platform. Yeah. And then the capabilities that was demoed earlier, like you know, live share and code spaces, really allow developers to help each other out, no matter where they're located worldwide. Yeah. And you know, GitHub with GitHub Actions, you can take the code you have developed and deploy it to any product and services. That's also such a great capability. And then the last piece I'm really you know, excited about is really Azure as the global you know, cloud infrastructure. And the ability to really scale you know, down to zero, all the way to you know, billions of transactions and millions of customers, and really planet scale. So that scaling capability to help you deliver your, to your business needs, to your customer needs, that is another thing I'm just really excited about. And so kind of connecting all of these pieces together, you know, we're really trying to enable developer to use any programming languages, and you can build, you know, use any operating systems, you can build any kind of applications, and any kind of services. And today I will also say from anywhere yep. globally. And then we want to help you do that in a really rapid way so you can you know, develop quickly and get value, time to market really quickly. Mm -hmm. And you can truly realize the, you know, the business value, the customer value in a much shortened amount of time. So like putting all of that together is what we think about as developer de yep. developer velocity. Yep. I mean, it's such a great time to be a developer. Like everything you're saying just makes me want to get in, start coding. And honestly, we're seeing so many young developers get in this space and it's tools like these that just keep them coming in and that we can support them grow in the industry. You know, all of this is really, really great, Julia. I'm even more excited to see what you're going to talk about in the round table next with Scott Hanselman and Kevin Scott. Um, and, you know, we're just getting started and excited to see what else you're going to bring to the table. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Thank you so much for having me here this morning, Felicia. Yep, and now let's send it over to Scott Hanselman for a special deep dive demo. Scott. Thanks, Felicia. Julie Strauss is with me. Julie, I understand that you've got an amazing demo for us. I certainly hope so. Let's see it. Yeah, as you might have seen from Amanda's uh, technical session, we did a full end-to-end -end of Toyota, an app they've built uh, in collaboration between their pro developers and citizen developers. And we're going to take a, a look at that and peel out some pieces and, and talk a little bit about them. All right, let's do it. So uh, the application they've built is really a vehicle quality app where whenever they deliver vehicles, they can look up the VIN numbers which they actually have in their legacy system, and check which accessories are supposed to be in the car they're about to deliver, so they can check whether or not they're deliver delivering the right accessories. Mm -hmm. So I'm in Visual Studio. Uh, they called upon their pro developers, obviously, to create a connector uh, for the app to call. So I'm in Visual Studio. Uh, it's a very simple Get API where they uh, uh, call a VIN number and a model to look up in the app. And one of the really neat things that we talked about in Amanda's session is this ability to, with a single right click, to actually publish this API as a resource into Azure without ever leaving Visual Studio. So I can very create, 
quickly create a new resource, publish that into Azure as an Azure function I'm choosing in this case, and I can simply go and uh, create that. I can either start from scratch without ever having done anything in Azure apart from having an Azure subscription and create the API. I can even uh, instantiate uh, API management, uh, which can now host these APIs. And the reason I want to host an API management is because that is that bridge where you can have your uh, whole economy of APIs, so to speak, that you can use in all your apps. But more specifically, you can push that into Power Apps, where now your citizen developers or yourself as a pro developer can just pick up this API and use it as any other data source. OK, so I'm hearing you say that with the help of the pro developer, you've made that bridge from a you know, legacy system, a mainframe, a something that uh, is now given, been given new life to have an open API written in one of the languages that developer division supports. And then you right click, you say publish, goes directly into API management. And then that open API is, is open for anyone inside of Toyota to go and use, including our friends at Power Apps. You got it. Very cool. Yeah. So let's take a look inside Power Apps mm -hmm. and see what it will actually look like when I start to consume this API, All right. which is now actually a custom connector. So here I am inside Power Apps. You can see all the different screens. Looks and feels a lot like PowerPoint, right? And we have uh, pre-built components that you can very quickly use. I've started with a semi-empty screen here. I have a text field and then a simple input field. And you can see here it's called text input three because I'm going to use it in a minute. We have added this VINOM but just for testing the API as we go. And if I go into my data sources, which you see over here, you actually see this Toyota logistics system, which is that custom API that now is a API management connector and works like any other data source. So the user won't even know that it, this is a custom API. Okay, so that custom API that we just made a moment ago that Pro Developer collaborated on made that legacy system a first class citizen in our citizen development environment. Exactly. And now I wouldn't know any different. I'll just work on it. So I'll pick a, a pre-built component because it's easy and just wire up this API to go and call that data. So I've selected here. I will simply go in and I will say Toyota logistic system. It comes up right there. And then I will uh, call the vehicle get vehicle request, which is the actual API. And now I'll go and call that text input field that we had before. Text uh, input three, there you go, dot text. And um, now, directly, I did nothing. It oh, is wow. literally calling up that this data is in that legacy system. You can see here, you can see the VIN again, you can see it's a Toyota Highlander, blah, blah, blah. You got a live preview there. I do. And it's very familiar that that formula bar looks like you know Excel and plain yep. things, data sources inside of Office that I've used before. Yeah. So for the citizen developer, this is really just like working in Office, mm. right? But with the help of the pro developers, you are able to bring that data in. And you get the same preview that you get for any other data source inside Power Apps. But it was really the accessories I wanted to look at. So all I do is add accessories. And now you see that level of data, like you see the LR wheel logs. This is what is supposed to be on that VIN number. So that's a very quick tour of how you can actually bring the value, bring in the pro developer, help accelerate that. And obviously, calling this legacy system, the value is just so much more for, for the user using the application in the end. That's fantastic. And actually, speaking of developers, you know, we have a virtual live audience right here. And we've got some folks from our Microsoft community. And I understand that uh, Cheryl, a developer, has a question. You are on Cheryl. Hey, Julie. You know, I'm working with a lot of different apps with a consistent look and feel based on our style guide. How can we achieve that with Power Apps? Ooh, that's a good one. We have really been focused on API and in, like how do we connect these legacy system and give them a new UI using pre-built components, which is super easy. You just drag and drop and wire it up. But for those of you who have like company style guides or even components or UI elements you might have built for other apps, you can pull in React components, simply take them through the CLI and publish it into Power App, and you can reuse these components. So any React component you've built for any other app, you can simply reuse here inside Power Apps as well. Wow, that really underscores the fact that the pro developer has a, a place in this world of citizen developers as a collaborator, whether it be collaborating to help get information out of legacy systems or existing open web systems, or bringing new and sophisticated custom UI components from a world like React 
into this experience as well. Absolutely. And I think the cool thing here is it's all these building blocks where you can either reuse what you already built or build new or even have the pro developer start using low code by assembling these. Once you deploy the app, it's one click and it's available on Android, iOS, the web, everywhere. So it's, it's really simple. Yeah, and to Cheryl's question, it's going to look like one of your company's yep. apps because it is one of your company's apps. Exactly. Very cool. Okay, this is fantastic. So where can people learn more? Oh, it's very easy. You can go to powerapps.com or just follow the link here on the screen and, and go learn more and explore. All right. Thank you so much. That was a great demo. Fantastic. And moving right along, coming up next is Nicole Herskowitz, business lead of Microsoft Teams, and she'll have a discussion with Rajesh Jha, Executive Vice President of Experiences and Devices. They're going to talk about how our new work normal is impacting modern app development in profound ways. Then our CTO, Kevin Scott, will take center stage, and we are topping things off with a fantastic roundtable, and we'll be taking more questions from our virtual audience. Don't go anywhere. Hi, my name is Nicole Herskowitz, and I'm the business lead for Microsoft Teams. And today I'm joined by Rajesh Jha, and we're going to talk about Microsoft 365 technologies, how work is evolving, and the impact that's having on application development. Hi, Rajesh. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me, Nicole. Well, you know, so much has happened over the last 18 months. It's fundamentally changed the way we work, the yep. way we live, the way we learn. What have you observed? What are your kind of key learnings? Yeah, you know, like we all know, it's been just an amazingly uh, exceptional 12 months. Um, the first, I think, as we all know, this is the year where everything moved to the cloud. You know, people think uh, work moved remote, but actually where it moved to was the cloud. And we saw that, you know, firsthand. Uh, as you know, we now have over 145 million daily active users of Teams. So we are proud of the fact that we were able to step up and help our customers and our users to really use Teams to do collaboration, stay connected, and move, uh, you know, move forward the office and teams. But, you know, Nicole, I think 2021 is going to be different from both 2020 and 2019. Uh, yeah, people, employees, I mean, they want flexibility. At the same time, we got to learn a new way of work, hybrid work. So it's, you know, we have a lot ahead of us. There really are these new realities of hybrid work. And Absolutely. so- Absolutely. So what are you seeing? I mean, how's Microsoft, how are our customers, how are our partners like building applications? Are they doing anything different that you're seeing? Yeah, you know, I mean, we've talked about that a bunch and you know, we think of it as basically three different eras of application development, if I, if I may. So the first era, of course, was GUI, the democratization of computing, moving to graphical user interfaces, Windows, the Mac, Win32 apps. And then I would say the next big era uh, that changed the way applications got developed was um, with web and mobile. And that was about being able to work anywhere. The focus was still quite a bit on individual productivity. And now during the pandemic, what's really come to the fore is team productivity, enabling a group of people to work together. And so we think this is the era of collaborative apps, where collaboration is at the center, whether it be synchronous in the context of a video meeting, whether it be asynchronous with documents and chat. And so with Teams, we feel we've got this user interface, the shell for collaborative apps that really is about group productivity, sync and async. So that's how we think about it. Really, the application developers, both inside of Microsoft and to the ISVs we actually work very closely with, we see the same thing. Collaboration is gonna have to be the core of new applications. Hmm, interesting, this new concept, you know, collaborative apps, this new app model. And it sounds like Teams plays this really critical role. Can you tell me a little bit more about what is a collaborative app and, you know, what is the benefit? Like, why should developers care? Yeah, I mean, you know, when we started Teams about a couple of years ago, or maybe three years ago now, we, we did want to focus on putting Teams first, hence the name. <laughs> and it was about group productivity. But we knew that collaboration was sync and async, sometimes in the context of a document, sometimes a shared dashboard, sometimes people needed to come together. And so collaborate, so what at the heart, what it is it about? It's not about a single application, it's about the way of work. 
And Teams is a new way of work. It brings all the app tools because of its platform. Mm -hmm. It brings meetings modality, chat modality, documents, third-party applications, you know, custom-built apps all together. But we think collaborative apps are, at its core, it's about collaboration, but it doesn't have to just be in Teams. You know, with Office itself, and yesterday Jeff Tieber showed how we are able to bring interactive components powered by Fluid right inside of Teams with the same components can be in other canvases such as Outlook or Office. So we think collaborative apps is about people, it's about groups, about group productivity. Teams, of course, is custom built for that, but it extends more broadly to the other applications as well. So it really sounds like the power of kind of teams plus the broader office applications really provides this user experience or this layer for exposing these collaborative apps. That's exactly right. Now yeah. there must be more, like is the Microsoft Cloud playing a bigger role here? Like what really are the various technologies that developers mm. can tap into to build these collaborative apps? You just take any classic application developer stack so we've talked about the user interface right now, the shell, Teams being the shell and interaction coming in the context of the work that people are doing in the flow. And so that's, think of that as a UI layer or the experience layer, whether it be in Teams, whether it be in Office or in some other canvas. Then the application logic, uh, with Teams you can plug in your own cloud logic using any PaaS service, whether it's an Azure platform services or any other cloud platform services. Or you could also reuse the rich platform, the low-code platform that we have at Power Platform. So you can write your logic uh, using any of that middle tier. Then at the data tier, we think there are two very important concepts. One is the Microsoft Graph. And the Microsoft Graph is really, it's the customer's most important database. It's where people, their relationships, the meetings, the documents, what they, what's shared with whom, what's trending in the organization, that's all captured in the Microsoft Graph. Now around Microsoft Graph, we've augmented that with some rich services. Yesterday we talked about the Azure Communication Service that allows the interop of Microsoft Graph Power Teams with any other custom build collaborative app that people go build. Fluid Framework is under the service that sits on top of the Microsoft Graph search connectors. So there's a bunch of stuff in Microsoft Graph. And then the other database that's really important also for our customer is the Microsoft Dataverse. This is where structured business process schemas live together. So you got, at the highest tier, you got Microsoft Teams and Office uh, with collaboration at the center. Then you have your business logic, whether it be in Power Platform or any Azure Pass service. And then you've got your databases that you could augment. You could bring your own schemas into these databases, or you could connect your middle tiers, your own databases. And then, of course, you know, as we also talked about how we build professional developer tools, VS Code and VS and GitHub, are we invested to make these great development environments to build these kinds of collaborative apps. Oh, that sounds fantastic. And I assume at the core, there's also at the bottom a foundational layer with identity yes, and security yes, and all those good things. Yeah, you're right. I mean, in the end of the day, customers expect enterprise-grade security and compliance, and it starts with identity and tying into that all the security and the compliance policies. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very excited about the kind of applications that we've seen uh, our customers starting to build, ISV starting to build, and how we ourselves are starting to build new applications in uh, e plus or in Office. Well, so that makes me, you know, I was wondering, is this collaborative apps like thing just a concept? Are there any real apps? Like is Microsoft betting into this concept of collaborative apps? Do you have any examples to share? Yeah, let's start with the, uh, some of the uh, work that we are excited to be doing with ServiceNow. We're doing something similar with Adobe and Workday and many other ISVs. But ServiceNow uh, in Microsoft Teams, you know, what we are doing there is imagine that you have a service incident. And when a service incident gets created, a connection back to the Microsoft Graph to find the relevant people to come in and work in the context of that incident. And then collaboration again at the core to resolve the service incident. And so with the APIs, you're able to immediately move into real time. And with Teams meetings extensibility, all the right artifacts of the ServiceNow ticket shows up in the context of the meeting. 
the chat captures all the async collaborations. So post-meeting, if somebody else were to hop onto that incident, the full context is available, whether you're inside of Teams or whether you're inside of ServiceNow. So this is what I meant by collaboration at the center. It is less about where the user is, it's about the user being followed with all the relevant artifacts and being connected to their team board. Another interesting one is Ernst & Young. They've built a bunch of these collaborative applications on Microsoft Teams. They've used Power Platform for their logic. They're using these applications both for internal use as well as customer facing for the entire life cycle of the engagement. And then at Microsoft, you know, we are starting to build our new applications with collaboration at the core. So like, for example, take Microsoft Viva. It's about employee wellness and productivity and knowledge and skilling and learning. And we are building this using the Microsoft Teams extensibility, the graph extensibility, the ability to take all this content, put that into the Microsoft graph so it shows up in the right place in Microsoft Teams. Super exciting. That's, that's really amazing. It's exciting to see our ecosystem, whether it's you know, ISVs, line of business apps being created right. that are you know, uh, these collaborative apps and even Microsoft. So that's thanks right. for sharing those examples. Now I'm still just thinking like, why should developers care? Like what's in it for them? Why Microsoft you know, kind of stack should they bet on for building these collaborative apps? What, what's the value proposition for developers? I, I'm excited about what we can offer developers here. First and foremost, an audience, 145 million engaged daily users in Teams alone. And if you build these collaborative apps, you get to be where the users are. Um, the second is when you write these collaborative apps, when you build to Microsoft Teams, you can write ones and run on any platform, whether it be on the desktop, on Windows or Mac, whether it be on the web or even on mobile. Because Teams, the platform, of how it brings different applications and modality is cross-platform. And then finally, and ultimately, it's the opportunity here is the economic opportunity to serve customers in this new evolving world. 2021 is the start of a new way of work, hybrid work. And the only way hybrid work is gonna really play out and drive productivity is by putting collaboration in the center and enabling teams to drive the right business outcomes. Rajesh, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, thank you everyone who joined us during this talk and enjoy the rest of Build. Thank you all for joining us today and welcome to Build. I'm joining you all from my own homemaker lab. Right now, I'm actually working on putting together an AI gadget, this little guy here, to help me with remembering to stand up and move around when I'm in long work meetings. I have a pretty interesting variety of tools here, which I always find super inspiring as I work on creative projects of my own. I'd like to talk a little bit about the idea of tools and how we as human beings use them to empower our own creativity and ingenuity, not just table saws and CNCs and oscilloscope like the things that you see here, but incredibly powerful technological tools like AI and machine learning that are increasingly becoming critical parts of every developer and maker's virtual workshop. If you think back to the very dawn of history, mankind has always used tools to solve our most vexing problems, turning our constrained zero-sum problems into abundance, opportunity, and prosperity. Our tools allow us to expand the frontier of what's possible, from building a safer, more prosperous world, to fostering our creativity and building community. Our tools are not just an essential building block of human society, but are an essential part of our own humanity. Over the past few decades, we've experienced a technological revolution that has put tools into our hands that are more powerful than our ancestors could have possibly dreamed of. The potential of technological tools like AI, the intelligent edge, and the intelligent cloud to profoundly transform almost everything around us is unprecedented. But maybe the most amazing thing is that right now, these tools can be accessed by practically anybody who wants to use them to help make their positive mark on the world. By combining the democratization of technology, the support of creative communities, and our own innate human curiosity, all the incredible power of these tools can be at your fingertips as programmers and creators. And the scope of what you can do with them is limited only by the boundaries of your imagination. So today, I wanna to encourage you to fundamentally reprogram how you think about applying technology as a creative tool. 
We're going to explore creative labs and spaces where people are using cutting-edge technology to create Grammy Award-winning music, explore the possibilities of programming for machine learning-powered edge and IoT devices, to start new businesses, and build new applications with supercomputing scale AI, and solve some of the biggest healthcare challenges on the planet with biotechnology. I recently had the great pleasure of chatting with our first guest on my podcast, Behind the Tech. Ben Bloomberg is a creative technologist who imagines, designs, and builds everything from electroacoustic musical instruments to AI-driven performances and tours. He's a recent graduate of MIT, earning his PhD. Ben and his creative partner, Jacob Collier, have an incredibly broad curiosity and ambitious creative vision. They've used existing technology in innovative ways to make art and to build community around it. And when their creative vision runs into obstacles, like how to turn Jacob's layered, harmonically sophisticated YouTube performances into live shows in venues around the world, they've invented new technology to make the impossible possible. In their hands, technology, even AI, is an instrument. Let's have Ben tell us more about how technology has been able to fuel his lifelong creative journey. I am a creative technologist, and I experiment with everything from sound design to software and hardware design. And I work uh, with artists to realize crazy and, and interesting ideas. I grew up in a very musical family. My grandmother was actually a music teacher and my grandfather was an electrical engineer. So um, I got really interested and excited about putting those things together. I had about 35 computers in my room. I like to take them apart and tinker with them. I love to imagine something and then build it. I found one of Jacob's videos in uh, at the end of 2014, actually, and uh, just on a whim sent him a message. And then he replied, I've got a performance and I'd like to be able to make the videos uh, that I make for YouTube live in front of an audience. So, you know, do you have any ideas about technology we could build that would achieve that? We really approached his project from the perspective of giving him more limbs. If he had 17 arms, you know, he could play 17 instruments. We were thinking as a technology as sort of more like a bionic prosthesis. We want to give him superpowers. The first question we had was, you know, how can we do this without making the audience sit and wait for him to build up all of these layers over and over and over again? The first part of that we thought should be what's called a harmonizer. Jacob specifically wanted to be able to use his to um, layer up these really complex harmonies really quickly. We only had actually about 16 days to build it. There's a Windows computer that's completely sealed and, and passive running uh, in, in the box. And then uh, there's some custom analog hardware. So it was really the combination of the harmonizer and, and this looping system together that allowed us to pull off uh, his first world tour. I think it's really important to have the freedom to mess up and to experiment and to take risks. One idea that my advisor, Todd Macover, pioneered at the MIT Media Lab was this concept where you have a performer expressing themselves through more media than just the instrument. We talk about sort of wielding an entire performance venue, lighting and sound and robotics and set automation and scenics it will happen that like everything in our lives will will sort of become instrument-like. You know, I think IoT plays a huge role there. You know, in the morning, you might try to find a way to choreograph your lights and your alarm clock and your coffee maker and the window shades to create these special, you know, experiences. Technology presents an incredible new language with a huge potential for expression in new ways. The most important technologies going forward are going to be technologies that encourage us to be more ourselves. I would encourage everybody to build systems that help people celebrate who they are and how wonderful it is that we're all different. Thanks, Ben. I'm amazed by what you and Jacob have created so far and really can't wait to see what you'll do next. 
Ben mentioned how excited he was to use a variety of home IoT devices to create immersive new experiences. The potential for using the combined power of the intelligent cloud and edge to program for a wide variety of IoT and edge devices is going to increase exponentially in the coming years. The opportunity for developers to create on this new ecosystem is going to be enormous. It's incredible to see what makers are already doing with technology and how powerful the hardware and software for innovating on the edge is becoming. I suspect that any of you who are part of that group will already be pretty familiar with our next guest and their work. MIT engineer Limor Fried founded Adafruit in 2005 with a goal to create the best place online for learning electronics and creating products for makers of all ages and skill levels. Today, Adafruit is one of the fastest growing US-based manufacturing companies, a certified minority and woman-owned business enterprise, and one of the biggest names in the maker world, creating phenomenally popular community-driven products and code. Let's join Lee Moore to learn more about how you can get started programming machine learning at the edge with Adafruit and Microsoft technology today. Hi everybody, it's me, Lady Ada, and I'm here at the Adafruit factory in downtown Manhattan, where we manufacture all of our electronic goodies, from accessories for the Arduino or Raspberry Pi boards, to our very own Feather and Circuit Playground Express. And we have a huge community of makers and engineers as well, with almost 30,000 Discord members, 1,500 GitHub repos, and weekly live shows almost every single day. So we have a lot of insight into what makers and engineers are doing with our products, and we're always so impressed with how creative they can be. I'm going to show you a demo using an Adafruit BrainCraft hat for Raspberry Pi and Microsoft Lobe. The BrainCraft hat fits on top of the Raspberry Pi 4 and makes it really easy to connect hardware and debug your machine learning projects. There's a 240 by 240 color display so you can see what the camera sees, which is great for vision projects. There's two microphones for audio input and then GPIO ports so you can connect things like relays, servos, LEDs, or other mechanical devices that you want to control from your Raspberry Pi. Microsoft Lobe is a free tool that you can use to create and train machine learning models that you can then deploy almost anywhere. This takes care of the hardest part of machine learning, which is creating and training a new model. I've been playing with the idea of using a Raspberry Pi, the BrainCraft hat, and a Raspberry Pi camera to recognize these delicious baked goods from my local deli. Now these baked goods don't have QR codes or barcodes, and so that's why using a camera with vision recognition would be an excellent way to identify and price each individual baked good. Let's show how easy it is to use Microsoft Lobe to train a new machine learning model. We're gonna create a new project called the Lobe Bakery. Now it's time to import image data. Click on import and select your webcam. Now it's time to train the model on different images of baked goods. Let's start with the cinnamon roll. Place the object you want to train in front of the camera and select the label that you want for these images. Now take about 20 images of your baked good. You'll want different poses, angles, maybe flip it upside down. Okay, I've got about 20 images of this cinnamon roll. I'm gonna continue doing this for each one of my baked goods. After I verified that my model is correctly identifying all of my delicious baked goods, it's time to export that model. Go to the export tab and you can see all the options. You can create a web app, you can export it to TensorFlow, to JavaScript, you can even make your very own REST server, web app, or run it on a mobile phone using iOS or Android. In our case, we want to export it to a TensorFlow Lite model file that we'll then copy over to our Raspberry Pi. Let's start by SSHing into the Raspberry Pi, then CD into the directory where I've downloaded the software. Now you can run the basic prediction project that's written in Python. Because I've already deployed the model, it's going to immediately start doing predictions based on one the Raspberry Pi camera sees. To start, it sees nothing. But when I put a cinnamon roll in front, the text will update, telling me the confidence and the label of the object detected. I can also try a cross bun or a bagel. Now, because we've deployed our machine learning model onto a Raspberry Pi, it means it's really easy for us to connect all sorts of other cool hardware. So I've got, in addition to the display, three LEDs that are gonna glow green when something is detected. I've got a speaker and some text-to-speech code that's going to speak out what's detected. And I've even got a receipt printer hooked up that'll print out the product and the price. So let's try it with the cross bun. 
cinnamon roll spot. Or my favorite, the cinnamon roll. Cinnamon roll. Or the bagel. Bagel. There you go. Thanks, Loeb. We sell the BrainCraft hat in the machine learning kit for Loeb at the Adafruit shop, and we've got tons of tutorials to get you started on your machine learning journey. Now that you've seen how easy it is, I can't wait to see what kind of creative projects you come up with. Thank you to Microsoft and Loeb for making machine learning training so easy. Now back to you, Kevin. Thank you, Lee Moore. I actually took a shot at building an Adafruit Loeb project of my own. The device that I was working on when you all first joined me was a little computer vision system built on an Adafruit Raspberry Pi Loeb kit running a Vision ML model trained with Microsoft Loeb. It will keep an eye on me when my monitor is engaged and remind me to get up and move around a little bit every 15 minutes or so. I started my engineering career over 30 years ago designing electronic control systems and writing embedded software. I'm just stunned by how capable these systems are today and how much I'm able to do just tinkering around in my spare time. Like I seriously just put this little device together in a couple of hours over the weekend. Now, let's change gears for a few minutes to talk about what we can do with truly immense computing power. Last year at Build, I announced our partnership with OpenAI to build one of the biggest supercomputers in the world. Since then, we've seen a ton of progress in large AI models and how we use them. We've gotten really smart about how to harness a certain set of algorithms and just massive amounts of compute in ways that have really allowed us to advance at a jaw-dropping rate. It's a mind-boggling amount of computing power, and we are speeding forward at an accelerating rate. But it's really important that we recognize that behind these huge supercomputers and behind the hype, AI is just another tool. It might be the most powerful and useful tool that we as human beings have ever seen, but it's only as useful as what we choose to do with it. Our modern AI systems are being used to solve a broader and broader range of problems every day. Big ML systems have gone from being useful to predict ad clicks and ordering information on results pages and in feeds, to helping us explore space, solve problems in aerodynamics, design molecules, and to tackle NP-hard combinatorial optimization problems like those at the heart of the logistics businesses on which we all depend. When reading Science and Nature every week, I'm beginning to see folks using ML techniques in places where numerical optimization and differential equations might have once been used. In this sense, AI is more like a new form of mathematics, a tool to help us better explore and understand the world than it is a substitute for human intelligence and ingenuity. Much of the world's progress on AI since the 50s, and even since the beginning of the deep learning revolution that started about 10 years ago, has been about AI systems getting better and better at narrow tasks. And in some cases, the systems have become superhumanly better at those narrow tasks. But the most interesting thing, and what we've clearly seen over the past year, is that we're seeing an acceleration and broadening of the cognitive tasks and of the complexity of problems that AI systems can tackle. I'm particularly excited about how AI can help us to be more creative and how it can give us more space and time to do so. Last year, OpenAI launched its language model, GPT-3, and we were blown away by some of the early outputs we saw from writing poetry to auto-completing lines of code. There have already been hundreds of businesses that have used GPT-3 to create new applications, including Fable Studio, which is creating a new genre of interactive stories and using GPT-3 to help power their story-driven virtual beings. Just a few months ago, OpenAI launched two new models, Clip and Dolly. These two models work hand in hand and are intended to better equip machines to understand the world in the same way as we as humans do. We take in information not only with what we read, but also in what we see and hear. So if we can expose AI models to data in the same ways that it is absorbed by people, they should learn concepts in a way that's more similar to humans. CLIP, which stands for Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training, offers a new way to make computer vision significantly more flexible in general, because the models learn directly from natural language, as in regular English, like I'm speaking right now. Computer vision is important because that's how these models actually see the world. Next, we have DALI. The DALI model can generate an image based on a natural language description. Again, a plain English description, such as a baby penguin in a red coat playing the piano, or a pig with a scarf flying an airplane. 
We've even used DALI to harness the massive power of AI supercomputing to solve one of the most vexing problems facing creators and developers today, creating infinite variations of Clippy. OpenAI is still uncovering the full extent of these models' capabilities and evaluating whether they can be deployed in a safe, responsible way. But we're extremely excited about what's to come here and the possibilities that all of this will unlock. As I mentioned earlier, we know it's you, developers, who can use powerful tools like GPT-3 to create ambitious applications that will leave a positive mark on the world. So I'm thrilled to introduce Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, who has some exciting news to share. Hi. I'm Sam Altman here at OpenAI. We're a research and deployment company dedicated to making sure that powerful, general-purpose AI is safe and benefits all of humanity. Last year, we made our 175 billion parameter language model, GPT-3, available to developers through an API in private beta. We've been amazed by what people have done with it so far. Developers are using GPT-3 to create realistic dialogue, summarize complex documents, answer customer service questions, and make search better than ever before. And those are just a few of the hundreds of applications in production today. We want to help push the boundaries of what powerful AI models can do and support really ambitious projects aimed at solving complex problems of the highest order. So today, we're delighted to announce the OpenAI Startup Fund, a $100 million fund managed by OpenAI investing in startups with big ideas about how to use AI to transform the world. We're very happy to have Microsoft as an investor in the fund as well. This is not a typical corporate venture fund. We plan to make big early bets on a relatively small number of companies, probably not more than 10. And we're looking for startups in fields where AI can have the most profound positive impact, like healthcare, climate change, and education. We're also excited about markets where AI can drive big leaps in productivity, like personal assistance and semantic search. We think that helping people be more productive with new tools is a big deal, and we can imagine brand new interfaces that weren't possible a year ago. These aren't the only applications we'll consider, but they're at the top of our target list. And we're especially excited to hear from startups led by founders from underrepresented groups. We hope to treat fund companies as close partners and work alongside the founders here. They'll get early access to future OpenAI systems, discounts on Azure, and support from our team. We're really excited about the opportunity for startups, for the industry, and for people everywhere who can put AI to work, improving their lives. So if you're a developer or an entrepreneur looking to build something transformational with AI, we'd love to hear from you. Applications are being accepted now at openai.com fund. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of Build. Thanks, Sam. Microsoft is thrilled to be able to support this fund. We think this will be a fantastic opportunity for folks to really make a difference with AI. The range of what we can do with these kinds of large AI models when applied to programming is awe-inspiring. But what can really change the world in ways we've only previously dreamt of is when we stretch the boundaries of our imagination and apply the benefits of massive ML models and AI supercomputing to solve problems in fields outside of traditional computer science. For those of us who are engineers or developers, we've spent our lives dealing with engineered systems. Those systems are complex, but nowhere near as complex as evolved systems like human biology. With today's massive computing power, with high volume experimentation and laboratory automation, and with innovations like large scale AI, we're at an inflection point of what's possible at the intersection of technology and biology. Using these technologies together, alongside the many advances in biosciences over the past two decades, increasingly allows us to treat these evolved biological systems the same way that we treat engineered systems, affording us greater understanding of how these complex systems behave, and in many cases, the ability to engineer them to do new and useful things. This means that solving problems that previously would have taken years of painstaking experimentation can be solved much more quickly, sometimes within days or even hours, by reusing engineered biological components or even creating brand new ones. We can now also split the hard work of experimentation efficiently between digital and wet lab environments. It's basically recasting biology itself as computation, giving us an immensely powerful computational bio lab. And it's a revolution that's accelerating incredibly quickly right before our eyes. Let me share one very timely example of how this is happening today. 
Microsoft is excited to be working closely with Dr. David Baker, a professor of biochemistry and the director of the Institute of Protein Design at the University of Washington. His research group is focused on the design of macromolecular structures and functions. When Dr. Baker began his work at the University of Washington, he decided to focus on the problem of something called protein folding. Each gene in our genome encodes a unique protein that carries out a unique function, and it does so because the DNA sequence in the gene encodes a unique sequence of amino acids, which then in turn fold up into a unique three-dimensional protein structure. These protein functions encompass every important process in our bodies and in the entirety of the biological life on the planet. So if you want to understand how these processes work, how to understand and prevent disease, or better understand the world around us, you first have to understand the interactions between proteins. You can think of these interactions almost like the relationship between a lock and a key, where they have to fit together very precisely to work. So it's incredibly important to understand the geometry of the structures and how they interact, the same way you need to understand how the parts of a machine fit together to make it work correctly. Until now, figuring out the chemistry and the physics of each individual three-dimensional structure has been incredibly challenging and expensive. What Dr. Baker and his team have been able to do is harness powerful computing technology to develop methods to go directly from the amino acid sequence of a protein to its 3D structure, bypassing incredible amounts of time and effort and enabling breakthroughs never before possible. One of these breakthroughs took place over the past year as we battled a global pandemic creating new drugs to combat COVID-19 at unprecedented speed. As soon as the genome sequence of the COVID-19 virus was made available, Dr. Baker and his team used the computational methods they've been developing to predict the three-dimensional structure of the protein on the surface of the virus, the so-called spike protein. When that spike protein is searching for an entry point for the coronavirus to attach to and infect human cells, it looks for something called an angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or an ACE2 receptor for short. The ACE2 receptor is the key to the spike protein's lock that, when engaged, allows the virus to slip into cells and wreak havoc in the organism it is infecting. Dr. Baker's team has designed small proteins that fold in such a way that they have a better match to the lock, becoming a more attractive target for the virus to latch onto. In doing so, they were able to create entirely new biological compounds that bound to the virus almost a thousand times more tightly than ACE2. These were completely novel proteins, unrelated to anything seen before in the natural world. The team and their collaborators were able to determine in the lab that the small proteins behaved exactly as expected, blocking the virus from getting into cells. And today, their discovery is now headed for clinical trials. Just imagine having the benefit of having processes like this ready for the next pandemic, or to design completely personalized drugs to fight debilitating chronic diseases or cancer, or practically anything else that could be imagined in the biological world all using software as a tool to custom build the precise biological molecules you need. It's something that would have been science fiction a decade or so ago, but it's being manifested as reality today because of the creativity and imagination of folks like Dr. Baker and his team. That innate human curiosity and imagination is exactly what I want to encourage all of you to give yourselves permission to use, to paint on an almost infinite canvas with the amazing technological tools we have at our disposal. We've showed you a bunch of these mind-bogglingly great technological tools today. Now, we at Microsoft and a whole lot of other people have been talking about this kind of technology for a pretty long time now. And it's understandable at this point, you might think, well, it looks and sounds cool, but so what? Does all of this AI stuff actually matter? Here's the thing. The challenges that we have in front of us as a species are as big as we've ever dealt with in the course of human history. Just think about the scope of what we have to do to fight climate change, provide high quality health care and elder care for a rapidly aging global population, combat the next global pandemic, and deal with a host of other crises that are going to demand an extraordinary amount of time and resources and impact your life no matter who or where you are on the planet. So all of this technology only actually means anything so far as it can empower the people who have access to use it to create a better future for all of us. We're building this technology in service of people and the problems they have. We're already seeing examples of how folks are creating some acute and impressive technological solutions for problems that we're going to face in the future. Using machine learning to identify plastic pollution in rivers and simulate how it moves in the ocean. 
These insights power passive cleanup systems to help remove plastic that impacts our ecosystems, or developing open source platforms for identifying and tracking wildlife, combining the strengths of AI and citizen scientists to help fight extinction. Our AI for Health team have developed a dashboard to track vaccine administration in the US and worldwide. To come to fruition at a larger scale, all of these kinds of things are going to require the innovation and ingenuity that only you can contribute. Part of the joy of using technology to create is that it should exist in a state of play. If it's not fun, we're doing it wrong. So I want everyone to know that Microsoft is committed to empowering whatever your creative dream may be, big or small, whether writing a song, creating software or IoT devices that help solve the world's hardest problems, or potentially saving millions of lives through cutting edge biomedicine. But to do so, we all have to expand our imaginations to unlock new and creative uses of technology that can be applied in the most powerful ways imaginable. If we do, what we can accomplish together can be truly amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, be safe, be well, and never stop creating. Fantastic, that was a really thoughtful talk. Hey everybody, Scott Hanselman here again with our esteemed roundtable. We have Julia Lucen, Brian Douglas from GitHub, and of course, Kevin Scott, fresh off of his talk. Let's dive in. That was really great. I love the motion graphics and the work that was put into that, Kevin. That was really special. I appreciate the effort that was put into that. Um, a question that I have is that we saw a bit about how large language models and other massive AI models are going to transform kind of the act of creation. How do you feel that these tools are going to help, uh, help society? Well, I, I think the, the thing that's really exciting to me that I've certainly seen over the course of my career and we've seen really accelerating over the past few years is that when you put increasingly powerful tools into a broader set of hands, uh, you know, this miracle of human ingenuity happens and people solve problems that we can't imagine. They see the world from different angles and perspectives and just interesting things happen. And as the tools get more powerful, individuals have more leverage to create more impact in the world. And so as these AI models broaden, as like the overall tool set that we have as technologists becomes more powerful, I, I'm really excited to see what people are going to be able to do to solve some of these really big vexing problems we have facing us as a society. You know, Julia, Kevin makes a really great point because he says when you give people who are creative, who want to solve problems the right tools, they can really make amazing stuff happen. Do you think that this is the best time ever to be a developer? Absolutely. You know, I think there's so many new challenges, as Kevin mentioned. Even like look at the setup. We're in this complete, completely hybrid world, which is completely unimaginable even last year. Um, and when I think about hybrid, you know, one of the very common questions I'm getting from my team is like, hey, we're thinking about going back to work. And what does hybrid workplace look like? And then we're thinking about well, what does that even mean? We have people who want to come to work maybe two days a week, maybe stay home three weeks. And then, you know, for any developer, you have your really big beefy dev boxes. Like, where is my dev box going to be? And the natural answer is like, well, I think your dev box probably has been in the cloud. That's the only way to support this really hybrid working environment. And so I think about with our, you know, code spaces announcement with GitHub and things like that, that really creates a, creates a great way for people to cr work, you know, uh, creatively, you know, in a hybrid way. The other thing I think is super important is the flexibility of the toolboxes. And if you think about like the Windows operating system, you can use Windows to build any kind of application. You can build Android application, you can build web application, you can build cloud application. The flexibility of the tools are so important. And if I think about our Azure announcement, how now you can use the same skills, building your application deploy in the cloud or in the hybrid on any Kubernetes cluster, that flexibility is also super important for developers to take the skills they have and build applications for any scenarios. Mm -hmm. Now, Brian Douglas, a lot of the conversation that we're talking about are open models and open tools. What do you say uh, to people who aren't on the open source train yet, who aren't using open source in their day to day? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Scott. And um, just want to throw back to Lady Ada's example with the donuts and doing AI models there. Uh, there's a, a quote I love talking about. It's, uh, if you want to be a friend, uh, sorry, if you want a friend, be a friend in an open source, if you can set up documentation or if you can jump in the community, get up discussions to be able to outline how to approach using code to solve problems like that, uh, that's a, a great way to get started. And I could use the documentation on my projects. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of other projects out there could also use documentation. So uh, definitely check out the feature GitHub discussions. If there's any questions, open answers that you could provide as well. 
That's a great point because when you want to contribute to open source, you don't necessarily need to be a coder. You could be writing documentation or tests. You can be helping people. You can be doing tech support. Open source is for everybody. Now, Kevin, a lot of the things that you're talking about in AI, many of those, mar those large models are open. There's open AI. How important is that, that th those things remain open? Oh, I think open is critically important when you think about AI. We, we, you know, to the point that I, I, I was trying to make in my talk, and that, uh, you know, the thing that I said just a few minutes ago, you want to have these tools in as many hands as humanly possible, because otherwise, like, we just don't know what they're really capable of. Uh, we, we will never understand the great uses to which they could be put unless we have lots and lots and lots of creators using them. So. You know, one of the challenges that we face with these big models is that big models require large amounts of compute to train, and the very biggest models that are on the frontier require a lot of expertise to build and maintain. Uh, and, and furthermore, to you know, sort of do all of the things that we have to do to make sure that the models are safe and that they're being used responsibly and ethically. And so having an ecosystem like the OpenAI API and tools like, uh, you know, the Power Platforms uh, FX product that we announced yesterday and like many of the things that Julia's team is working on really lets us sort of democratize the access to these big systems uh, where we can invest in a big platform and put it into the hands of lots of people so everybody doesn't have to have their own AI supercomputer just to get started. Yeah, putting a lot of uh, these things in the tools of everyone, making sure that all the tools are available to everyone, whether their bandwidth or their CPU is limited, making large developer boxes, like Julia mentions, available to everyone with code spaces is really important. Now, Julia, you've been involved in technology a long time. We saw you talking to Felicia about kind of your own journey. I'm curious how you have seen technology and tools evolve over the last few years, and where do you see it evolving to really spark even more creativity in the coming years for development teams? Yeah, and I think that there are so many different dimensions we can go. If you just take AI as an example, and I think the point that Kevin made about democratizing is so important, where I think that we're trying to go is meet developers where they are. So let me give you an example. You know, if you, we believe like in the long run, every developer will be building AI intelligent applications. So if you don't know anything about the model, you can use things like Azure Applied AI Services, and basically calling, you know, taking advantage of these models, kind of like an API to begin with. And then the next level is to say, well, I might have my own operate, my own company data. I want to go train my own particular model. And then we know we have tools like PyTorch Enterprise that really helps you do your own experimentation and actually get your own model training going. And then at some point you say, I really want to work on one of these massive models like what Kevin has been talking about that's fundamentally changing the dynamic. With that, you can think about how Azure is being this global AI supercomputer that you can do all of your trainings in on that. So I think that that is an example of we basically deliver all of these capabilities based on your need. So one of the most exciting for me is that how we're meeting, we're meeting developer where they are using the tools and language that they are familiar with and helping them build the business value that they're looking to do. That's a really great statement that we're, we're meeting the developers where they are. Brian Douglas, you know, a lot of developers are on GitHub and GitHub is where creativity and empowerment really sparks. Uh, you know, how has GitHub been empowering uh, developers most recently? I, I feel like GitHub Actions has really sparked a lot of things because GitHub Actions went to where the developers already were. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the beauty of this is a lot of these GitHub Actions are open source, including mine. So I just want to shout out to Scott, your awesome t-shirt at Beyond CSS. I'm a Beyonce fan, and I created this thing called the, the Baybot, which is a Twitch integration to basically have some fun stuff to happen live on Twitch. And uh, I actually deployed this uh, on the Azure box uh, using the GitHub Action, which is Azure Web App Services. And I'm able to leverage tools that Microsoft's given, given to me for free through GitHub Actions, but also other community members also deploying and adding features to this Baybot. And uh, so I'm able to live on the air while live streaming, I can ship a new feature to the Twitch inter interactions and uh, see that go to production on the power of GitHub action runners. And uh, again, a lot of this is open source. You can check out my repos, check out new actions on the GitHub marketplace as well. It's so amazing that we can do all of these things that we couldn't even conceive of even a few years ago, and all of these tools are available to us in the cloud, allowing us to be more creative and to do it, like you said, live, like we're doing this conversation live, and you're coding live on Twitch and other places as well. That's pretty fantastic. And speaking of live, what we're going to do is we're going to hand the reins over to our amazing audience. Uh, let's see if someone has a question from our audience here on Together Mode and Teams. 
I think Jason has a question. So this question is for Kevin. I saw your keynote and I was super inspired, but I just have one question. As a software developer, what's the one thing that I need to do to prepare for the future? Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastically good question. Uh, I was thinking about uh, thinking about this um, actually the, earlier this week. I, I've been programming for 37 years, and like the one constant that uh, I've seen over those 37 years is change. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think what everyone ought to be thinking about every day is how I can add new things to my toolkit. Um, this has been a constant push for us at Microsoft over the past handful of years. Like, how do we make sure that machine learning goes from this thing that only a handful of experts are using to create amazing things to something that every developer inside of Microsoft is thinking about how they can incorporate into their products. And through the power of our Azure platform, our open source tools, our developer tools, how we can make the benefits of those machine learning models available to the tens of millions of developers across the world and even beyond that. And so, you know, I, I think the thing the biggest piece of advice that I have for developers is just try to constantly be learning and figuring out ways to add those new things to your toolbox to enrich your capabilities and to try to be as creative as humanly possible in applying those tools to solving problems that other people care about. Good advice, good advice. The only thing constant is change. I think we actually have time for one more question. I see that I think Petra has a question for Brian. Yes, hello, my name is Petra Thomas and I'm based in Redmond, Washington in the US. Um, Brian, do you have any open source project management tips to share? Brian, great question from Petra. Do you have any open source project management tips to share? Yeah, yeah, and uh, open source management tips. Uh, I've been using GitHub projects pretty heavily. Uh, it's a great tool to organize my life. So what, what I like to use is uh, get a project on my own um, GitHub profile, and I can organize issues across other GitHub re repos. And I can organize that as if I want to go ahead and learn something new, or if I have a, a huge project that has multi uh, angles, I have to go at it. So definitely check out GitHub projects, and uh, we have some pretty cool things that we'll be shipping on that soon. So pay attention to that. Very cool. A lot of great stuff happening here. Uh, Julia, when we're working with these developer tools uh, and uh, we see that they're starting to connect to the cloud, is it going to blur the line between what's happening on my computer and what's happening in the cloud computer? Very yes. briefly as we get to the end here. Absolutely. And if you think about, you know, I think in many ways we're talking about the virtual, real, the virtual world and the physical world are kind of blurring. And then if you think about, you know, the, the dynamic of like what is on the edge, what's in the cloud are blurring. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about, you know, like what is on your computer is constantly roomed, you know, in the cloud. And we talk about ideas that you can take your dead box and throw it away or like move it around. So I think that it's really have to go as a developer on the top of where's your state? Where's the master? Where's your, you know, what is the heart of your, like, what is the master state of your, you know, source code and projects, all of these important things? It's going to be in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And the idea you can access it from anywhere that you are at. And that is the power of the cloud. That is the power of the cloud. Thank you so much, our audience members, and to our amazing round table, Julia Lucen, Brian Douglas, and our own Kevin Scott. You've all been very helpful and very generous with your time. The fun and the learning continues after Microsoft failed into focus. If you haven't made a GitHub account, create one today. You can go to github.com slash join. And that's the show. Seth, Felicia, it's gone by way too fast. That was awesome. I literally cannot believe it's all over, Seth. I can, Felicia, because 2020 was like, I don't know for y'all, but it felt like it didn't even happen, and time is so fast. Time isn't even real. Yeah, I honestly cannot believe that I've escaped my virtual scape, and I'm physically with you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. I'm, I'm glad. Any takeaways? For me, I love when Kevin Scott was in his own shop building stuff with the Adafruit. <laughs> I'm like, I want to buy one of those. I want to use it. I want to make sure. So I'm just totally excited to go online and buy that and then uh, make my own. See, but Kevin Scott was smart because he was doing like this stand up model. So maybe I'll do one where it like looks at my yoga poses because I'm really, I'm really good at yoga. I mean, I'll, I really? do it here, but I don't want people to be embarrassed that they can't. I'm, 
I, I, I want to watch that. I, I, I'm Maybe gonna, later. Yes. I, I, okay. D- okay. Maybe not on camera. Yeah. Yeah. You it, know, I really want to thank our virtual audience, those mm-hmm. sets. They've been so great today. I really felt like they kept my spirits up. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah they've been awesome. So if we can cut to the look at them behind us. They're just wonderful people. Yes. Shout out to y'all. And it's good because, you know, I, I'm look, I'm used to being in front of an audience and yes. drawing the energy from. Wow. Look at the energy as they wave. It's just like. It's like they're patting me on the back or hitting me on the head. I'm not sure yeah. which one. Seth, you wanted to be a comedian, didn't you? Yeah. Is it? What do you, what do you think? Um, awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. It's been great here. And thank you to Scott for being our co-host. Now it's time for me to say bye, Felicia. No, you You know, we workshopped this and we didn't have to do this, Seth, but... Um, Well, anyway, thank you, everyone. Have a great build, and it was a pleasure having you.